Good day to everybody. I am Nicolas Bornois of Capital Link, and I would like to welcome you and thank you for joining uh, today's uh, webinar that is being put together and sponsored by Enatec, uh, a Glencore company. Uh, today's uh, webinar is on the very timely and very interesting topic of Swift Happens, Shipping and Bankering, Markets Brace for a Change. Now, indeed, the global bankering industry is going through a significant change as the result of, uh, on one hand, uh, COVID-19 effects, and on the other hand, and even more so, the race towards decarbonization. And of course, in the overall scheme, uh, bankering and fuels play a pivotal role, uh, and this is what we're going to be discussing today. Our webinar today is composed of two parts. We are starting with a presentation on global bankering and global shipping by Randy Givens, the head of maritime uh, research at Jefferies. Everybody knows Randy. I would like to thank him for uh, uh, preparing an excellent presentation, introductory presentation on the topic. And then we are having a panel discussion led by Captain Alok Sarma of uh, Inatech. Uh, and we have, as he will uh, uh, elaborate, uh, a panelist a diversified group of panelists from various aspects of the industry providing an over, uh, you know, a, a very compact and comprehensive review of uh, sector issues. And without any more delay, I would like to turn the floor over to uh, Randy. By the way, you can always submit questions during the uh, webinar and your questions will be answered uh, after the panel discussion. And just as a reminder, this will also be available as an archive upon demand for those who will come to uh, access this webinar later. Randy, the floor is yours and thank you for joining us. Absolutely, my pleasure. Hey, thanks for having us, Nicholas. Uh, looking forward to this um, webinar and even more so the panel uh, right after my prepared remarks. So starting with the slide deck uh, that we have here put together to show uh, walking through some of the things around IMO 2020, uh, and then obviously looking ahead, IMO 2023, IMO 2030, and beyond. So starting with bunkering, uh, if we can go to the next slide, we'll focus first on IMO 2020. Uh, obviously, that was a, a lot of headlines, a lot of news from 2018, uh, really until COVID happened uh, in maybe March of 2020. But uh, just a, a quick recap here. IMO 2020, it reduced the global sulfur cap on marine fuels from 3.5% to 0.5%. You know, that started in uh, January 1st, 2020. Enforcement was a question. That said, there's been very strong compliance um, from pretty much everyone across the industry, especially the, the larger players, both on the chartering side, the traders, um, the ship owners, for sure. A lot of companies prepared well ahead uh, of the deadline. And there was a, a split consensus, right? No one really said this is the answer, this is the right answer, right? You had, you had two sides of the argument for how to best comply with IMO 2020. On one hand, you had companies like Scorpio Tankers, Starbuck, Genco, International Seaways, Eagle Balk, DHT, right? They all invested heavily in scrubbers. A lot of the reasons were around the optionality they provide. Look, we can burn VLSFO and we can continue to burn HSFO and the attractive financial returns. A lot of these companies were looking at payback periods within two to three years, um, very high IRRs on scrubber investments. On the other hand, you had very large players say, you know what, we're not gonna do scrubbers. Euronav, uh, TK Tankers, Nordic American Tankers, Diana Shipping, Ardmore, and, and countless others, right? There was some concern around the technological kind of uncertainty around scrubbers, will they work? Will they add additional costs? Who knows? And then there was an environmental or regulatory uncertainty around if scrubbers would eventually be banned. So all that being said, with the scrubbers, there was a lot of um, uh, congestion at the shipyards and at the uh, locations of the ports that the scrubbers were being installed, right? They were pretty much fully booked, especially in the back half of 2019 um, and into the first half or so of 2020. So that pulled a lot of capacity out of the market for a short term uh, time period. And then with the higher fuel cost, you saw vessels slow down, you saw some accelerated scrapping. So 
IMO 2020 uh, turned out to be good for the industry, especially leading into those first few months of 2020. But then obviously COVID-19 put a dramatic downward pressure on the fuel spread. Um, the fuel spread was over $300 a ton at the beginning of 2020. It fell to $40 a ton, really at, at the trough in mid-2020 um, when you had very tight crude prices, uh, diesel, everything else. So. All that said, most scrubbers have already recouped the investment within just the past two years. So a lot of the early adopters are certainly pleased with their decisions for scrubbers, especially if they decided on that in 2019. Now, going forward, we do favor the companies with scrubbers installed on the larger vessels, right? The VOCCs, the LR2s, the Cape sizes. Um, and we think there will be additional scrubbers installed there. But the, the economics on, on really the smaller vessels not as attractive. So if you look at the next slide, uh, we'll see why, right? So again, back to three reasons to comply. You could obviously just switch to VLSFO, um, a, a blend, right, of MGO, which is 0.1% sulfur content, with your HSFO and kind of blend out to 0.5%. You can go straight marine gas oil, diesel. Now, there's certainly higher cost fuel uh, with these lower sulfur, sulfur levels. Um, and then there's no additional CapEx, right? No vessel modifications, you just switch to the new fuel type. On the other hand, the other option was installing scrubbers, as we mentioned. Now you can continue to use the cheaper HSFO and, and kind of scrub out the, uh, the extra sulfur. Now the cost was about two to four million, uh, depending on the, the size of the vessel. And the off hire was anywhere from 40 to 50 days, really. Payback period, however, was looking to be 18 to 24 months for most owners. And it certainly started that way in 2020. Again, the, the spread really collapsed, but has since rebounded, which we'll, we'll get to in a second. But all that being said, if you look at those middle charts, there's been a lot of uh, scrubber penetration throughout the tankers, um, the very large container ships, and even in the largest dry bulk sector, right? We're looking at about 25 to 30% of the fleet uh, overall. Now, your estimated scrubber premiums a day. So this is using a, a range of fuel spreads, going from 100 to 500. Now, right now, we're closer to the 150 level. But again, even at that level, on a VLCC, it's almost $5,000 a day in benefit. In a Cape size, it's about 3,000. On an Aframax, it's 2,500. So there's certainly some benefits there to having the scrubbers. And the third way to comply, which was certainly early years ago, and might be early today, but we'll get to that in a second, are some of these alternative fuels, LNG, hydrogen, ammonia, methanol, right? LNG is currently the only real feasible alternative fuel uh, that has some large quantity. It's largely available um, at the large ports, right? There's been an influx of new build orders that are dual fuel or LNG capable. Uh, that has certainly been uh, the order du jour uh, in terms of fuel propulsion uh, and fuel type going forward. It's kind of having that dual fuel uh, capability. And then lastly, some hydrogen, ammonia, other biofuels, likely uh, the future of the industry um, as well, but really the technology is not there yet. So if we switch to the next slide, we'll see just the, the volatility in the historical VLSFO, HSFO spread on a dollar per ton basis. On the next slide. So you'll see it started, um, you know, it really surged in the back last few months of 2019. It hit, like I said, above $300 a ton in early 2020, and then that fell dramatically uh, with COVID, all the way down below $50, even $40 um, by late 2020. And then it's kind of ebbed higher throughout the year. You had a, a little bit of shock there in April, May timeframe. Uh, but now again, it's about $140 a ton. And you can see on that table at the bottom there, kind of the global average of VLSFO is about 580, uh, for HSFO is about 440. So you're looking at about $137 for a spread. Now, at the next slide, kind of looking ahead, right? So we continue to believe that the larger vessels will clearly benefit the most from scrubbers. The, they burn more fuel, they spend more time at sea, uh, so there's increased savings there. Plus, the HSFO, VLSFO fuel spread, it's widened, as we've seen in recent months, and there's been increased volatility, so we're trading around it. And then the availability at the, uh, of VLSFO is can be limited at the smaller ports, right? Uh, are they going to carry HSFO, VLSFO, all the different fuel types? So again, we like the larger vessels than that. Also, in terms of the spread, we think it widens, right? Although the contango here obviously is going to drop in the next few months, 
it's basically mirrors the crude uh, contango, so the crude forward curve. So there will be probably a drop in the next few months, but then kind of a, a further slow and steady expansion of that spread. One is the increased jet fuel demand, right? That is going to basically boost the price of VLSFO. The overstock of jet fuel is, is going to decline eventually, right? When is it? This month, next month, a year from now? Who knows? But as travel starts to increase, and then refineries are going to focus more on jet fuel and less on the VLSFO. So there'll be less supply of it. On the other hand, we do think the increased oil production will put downward pressure on HSFO, right? So those medium and heavy sour grade types are better suited for HSFO. So you might see less VLSFO, more HSFO being produced as a result, a wider spread. So last slide for me, and then I'll turn over to the panel. But if you look kind of beyond IMO 2020, right, future regulations are resulting in a lot more uncertainty. And we've seen this from vessel ship owners, right, not really ordering new builds because of this uncertainty. But looking first at IMO 2023, that is to reduce carbon emissions to meet the minimum efficiency standards of the EEXI, the Energy Efficiency Existing Ship Index. And that's increasing the threshold each year uh, from 2023 to 2026. I believe you have to reduce your, your carbon emissions by 3% a year there. Now, you can reduce the, the fleet age by scrapping your older ships, and then you would also slow down, right? Slow steaming, I think, is right now the consensus choice and the easiest way to reduce your emissions. Now, when it comes to IMO 2030, that's to reduce carbon emissions on an average across the shipping industry by 40% compared to the 2008 benchmark levels. Now there's gonna be annual carbon intensity standards and requirements, new fuel or engine efficiency standards, right? That's why you've seen a lot of these kind of dual fuel LNG powered ships being ordered. Um, IO 2050, a little longer term, vessels today won't be around in 29 years. Vessels ordered today probably won't be around in 29 years either. Um, but just looking at it, you know, it wants to reduce, the goal is to reduce carbon intensity by 70% compared to the 2008 baseline and to reduce GHG, greenhouse gas emissions, by at least 50%. The mechanism for this is, is certainly unknown at this time. Uh, there will, will be further regulations and progress uh, on the above, right? It's kind of step changes, 23, 30, 50, and then IMO 2100, you know, we're, we're pretty far away from that, but the the ultimate goal is to reduce all emissions to zero percent. We're talking full decarbonization. Certainly music to the ears of, of European uh, regulators and, and ESG friendly folks. But again, being um, 79 years away, uh, the uh, mechanism is unknown at this time. So again, how to comply similarly to uh, the potential for IMO 2020, which we didn't see much of, but certainly for IMO 2023 and 2030, where it's more carbon focused and less on the sulfur side, is through these new fuel types, LNG, hydrogen, ammonia, methanol, something else. So again, we think LNG is, is the, the most feasible large scale alternative. Uh, we've seen a lot of dual fuel VLCCs, container ships, even some dry bulk orders. Um, now there has been some interest in ammonia ready ships and hydrogen, but again, it's a much smaller component of the market. So. Uh, that's it for me. Uh, I'm happy to take any questions now, or we can jump straight into the panel. They know a lot more about this than I do, so uh, looking forward to discussing this further with them. Randy, thank you for uh, a great introductory presentation. You put a lot of uh, very interesting information out there, and uh, you clearly set the background for the discussion that is going to follow. I'd like to invite uh, Dr. Uh, Captain uh, uh, Alok uh, Sharma uh, from Inatech, uh, who and, and the panelists, who is going to moderate the panel discussion. And as you will see, we have uh, a diversified uh, group of panelists, top level panelists from various aspects of the industry. And uh, I think this will uh, help provide you with a very compact and comprehensive view of what's happening in the sector today. Uh, Captain Sharma, the floor is yours, uh, and uh, let you introduce the uh, our esteemed panelists. And thank you to everybody for joining. Thank you very much, Nicholas and Randy, for setting the tone of the webinar. And I'd like to welcome our audience joining from across the globe. Uh, I'm Alok Sharma, Senior Vice President at Inatech, and I'm delighted to be your host. 
A quick word about us, Inatech is a part of Glencore Group and we work with a lot of the audience members. Uh, we produce a software used by consumers, producers and traders of energy products to optimize the supply chain, manage the risk and generally run the business. In this webinar, as, as Nicholas mentioned, we will draw upon the experience of senior management in top organizations and get their perspective on the key trends within the industry. Uh, we will touch upon uh, shipping, bunkering, <clears throat> and digitization as the key topics. So without further ado, I have the pleasure of introducing this panel. So we have uh, Duncan McLennan, Group Technical Director, Columbia Ship Management. Uh, we have Konstantinos Kapitanakis, Bunkering Director of Starbulk, James Bradford, Global Head of Technical at WE Group, Steve B., Group Commercial Director, VPS. And of course, everyone has already heard from Randy Givens, Group Head of Energy and Maritime Shipping at Jefferies. I think it's safe to say that anything not known by these gentlemen in the energy and shipping space <coughs> is probably not worth knowing. Uh, right, so we're gonna conduct this discussion in three segments, the current, the immediate future being 2022 and the medium term beyond 2022. So I'd like to dive right in. Um, what everybody's talking about is the Omicron variant, you know, the so-called fourth wave. And as we cope with increased volatility in the markets, the question I'd like to pose to the panel is, are there any lasting impacts of COVID on shipping and bunkering? Uh, has that changed our business in any way? Can I start with you, James? Uh, yes, um, <clears throat> good morning, uh, good day to everybody. Um, I think the short answer to that is uh, most certainly, and um, I'd like to really sort of uh, focus on our offshore crew in particular at this particular point in my response. And in comparison to pre-COVID life uh, globally, our crews are subjected <clears throat> to not only intensified uh, international travel regulations, but also local regional regulation with regards to quarantine, COVID testing. And in addition to those pressures placed upon our crew, um, we need to continue operating our vessels in a COVID safe way. You know, the application of safe practices, PPE, face masks, hand sanitation, et cetera, procedures that have been in place now for the last couple of years. In addition to the, the, the practical considerations uh, which uh, remain within our, our business, uh, there is the, the vaccination program that is still being rolled out globally. And uh, we are uh, in doing, uh, in, I would say sort of uh, encouraging our crew to participate within the national uh, vaccination program and to participate in the potential to be vaccinated as and when our vessels uh, come into any particular port that can offer that. But there are challenges. Um, there is out there still skepticism, a lack of trust with regards to vaccine types and brands. And uh, if I can cite our own situation within Regroup, um, at any one time uh, offshore, we have circa 25,000 uh, employees. And at the moment, we are sitting at about a 30% um, fully vaccinated uh, sort of rate. And uh, clearly, that uh, has got to be pushed a little bit further and accepted. Uh, by our crews uh, out there. And uh, hopefully uh, this will uh, protect them and protect others as we continue business. Throughout this uh, sort of pandemic, uh, pandemic we've lobbied uh, for key, our, our crews to be identified as key workers. And uh, you know, for them to be identified sooner rather than later. And to be quite frank, uh, the delay in granting such status is quite incomprehensible, especially when one could quote a simple fact, uh, you know, the globe is made up of 70% of water and 90% of world trade goods are transported by ships manned by the seafarers that we are lobbying for. So in short, we, we need to keep lobbying the governments uh, to grant this status to our seafarers. With the surge of the Omicron variant, uh, it's important to draw lessons from past practice, implement appropriate measures and ensure seafarers are a focus of our attention to keep glo uh, global trade ticking. But um, from the offshore side, uh, we also must look at uh, the onshore side. Um, you know, has it changed our business? Uh, I would suggest quite dramatically, and uh, certainly within V Group, hybrid working uh, has proven to work, and we would suggest that it is here to stay. Um, v Group has adapted policies, procedures uh, to reflect this uh, transformation, but this does bring to surface other challenges that uh, must be dealt with. 
uh, in moving forward in such an environment. And uh, cybersecurity comes to the front. And whilst it's always been important, it's even more so with employees working from home. The benefits and challenges of hybrid working are real and specifically when employing such a transformational uh, method, uh, the pros and cons must be equally assessed. And where I'm coming from here is that, you know, the positives, yes, companies may be able to move to a reduced office footprint, uh, become greener because of that and become more cost effective. But the must do's as we have identified within Vigra is to create space for social engagement to avoid isolation of employees who are working uh, within a hybrid arrangement. One other observation that uh, V Group has made and uh, can certainly attest to is customer clients. Uh, in many cases, uh, the customer ship manager relationship indeed has been strengthened uh, due to regular touch points, updates that have been necessary throughout the pandemic. And I would suggest that the uh, transactional environment that we are so used to has become far more relational wherein there has been increased understanding and support with regards to challenges faced. And maybe to sum that particular statement up, I, I'd suggest that trust has grown increased uh, between those parties. Um, that's certainly uh, how we see uh, the impact of COVID and uh, has had on not only society, but our business. Thank you. Thank you very much, James. I think, you know, you've really touched on some, some really, you know, key issues there. Uh, uh, perhaps I can turn to Steve, you know, Steve, I mean, you know, the, the sort of the bunker surveying business was, <coughs> was a very face-to-face -face interaction. And, you know, you've obviously, you know, VPS is a market leader on there. Would you say that that the model as we as we knew it of surveying, has that changed in any way for, way for you or is it uh, largely the same? Um, no, it's, uh, well, first of all, thank you, Alok, for, for the introduction and uh, good day to, to everybody around the world. Um, I would say, yeah, in, in terms of BQS, this has probably been the one service that BPS provide which has been um, directly affected by COVID. Obviously, there's always a concern when you know a, a visitor to a to a ship or a vessel um, may obviously pose a particular risk. So, you know, we've seen a number of our uh, shipping customers who have either reduced the the number of uh, surveys that they want wish to undertake or stopped that service altogether. Um, a number of customers have, where there have been small stems which have been delivered to a vessel, they decided not to run it, an additional risk of, of uh, a surveyor boarding the ship. Um, <clears throat> as I say, some others have just decided to stop that service. However, things have been improving um, as time has, has gone on. Uh, obviously, we, we do share operational practices with our clients. Certain clients have specific directives that they want us to follow proof of vaccination, proof of testing, et cetera, uh, wearing the, you know, uh, maybe it's a higher level of PPE. And we have to be flexible and we have to ensure uh, that, we, that we comply with that, not only for the safety of the crew on board the ship, but also for the safety of our own employees as surveyors going to that ship. So I would say definitely BQS has been probably the most effective in terms of a labor intensive service uh, and face-to-face -face, uh, service. However, if I, if I just briefly dive, uh, digress to the, the lab testing side of things, what we've managed to do throughout the course of uh, the COVID pandemic is ensure that our labs are fully operational. So we're still able to provide that 24 seven uh, support. However, there has been a differential uh, in practices. Here, what we've had to do is we've had to split our laboratory teams into team A and team B at each lab location and do a, a thorough clean down in between the two shifts. So team A will work one time, throw a clean down in between, then team B will start. Obviously, that adds further complications to the working day. Uh, and it's also quite uncomfortable, you know, the lab staff having to wear additional uh, PPE, working in a hot laboratory, et cetera. Um, but by splitting the teams, we've reduced the, the, uh, the amount of contact between the, the team members and being able to ensure that we can actually continue that delivery of service throughout the whole pandemic. So thankfully, our labs have never had to, to close down or cease operation. Uh, we've been able to, to continue that. And in terms of keeping in contact with our customers, we've seen obviously a, a huge increase in the use of video technology, such as Zoom and Teams, which has enabled us to keep in contact with our customers. That in turn, <clears throat> obviously has um, you know, meant that you know, we're, still able to listen to their issues, still be able to handle their problems. And to be fair, I think video 
calls such as you know, this type will continue long after COVID, um, you know, because it is a much more efficient way of actually dealing with, with customers. It can't necessarily take the place of face-to-face -face meetings, but it's the next best thing. And let's face it, it also reduces carbon footprint by not having to travel as much. So there's been some detrimental aspects of COVID, but there's also some technology developments, which has actually been, uh, I think, um, a, a pro to the, the, uh, the whole uh, process. Indeed. Well, thank you very much. Uh, uh, Konstantinos, if I could come to you, please. Obviously, as a, as a global ship operator, you know, the ships literally go from, you know, the whole business is to go from one part of the world to another. And, and as such, you know, in, in many ways, there is, you know, not a choice, there's a com commercial imperative. But how has that changed for you, please, if you want to comment? Sure. Hello, everybody. Thank you. Thank you, Alok. I, I will be very brief since the previous speakers have uh, touched upon all the main elements of this uh, change. Well, bank of business has changed dramatically the last couple of years, and uh, not only due to COVID. I'm not even sure we will be calling it bunker business anymore. It is fuel in general and energy that is now becoming the core of our business. Well, the main COVID impact has been, as was previously mentioned, specific ports uh, quarantine regulations, which have affected vessels uh, either calling there for operations or the need to change crew. Uh, and these disruptions seriously uh, affect vessels' trading pattern, which in turn affects their bunkering scheduling. So this has become much more complicated. Uh, moreover, uh, COVID occasionally, if not invariably, affects the interaction between vessel and barge and complicates issues in case of a quantity dispute. Uh, everything is done remotely, as you know. Uh, other than that, uh, it's not, uh, it's prices have been uh, um, extremely volatile because of COVID as well. And uh, due to the current uncertainty surrounding Omicron, uh, we don't yet know how this variant will impact demand. We, we hear different news and updates on a daily basis, which affect not the core fundamentals, but affect sentiment a lot. Um, uh, last, uh, I would say that COVID has caused problems to resurface, problems which, which were rather hidden up to now, mainly credit ones. Uh, these reappeared with a vengeance, and we do see suppliers struggling sometimes either to actually survive or to hold on to their market position. So uh, these circumstances call for vigilance in all respects, especially on the quality of fuel, of course, but also on uh, thorough due diligence. But other than that, I think uh, what uh, James said about vaccination, what Steve said about inspection, these two are huge challenges and um, we're dealing with them because we have no other option. Thank you. I, I understand. Oh, thank you, Konstantinos. And, you know, Duncan, it's always hard to be the you know, last one in, but uh, is there, you know, uh, for, from your perspective, I guess, is there a validation that indeed we are in a different world right now? You know, sort of never to go I back think, to previously. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, Jim uh, and Steve covered a great deal of the issues. I, I think you know, the last couple of years, shipping has been forced to look internally at itself, at the processes and practices, and with a great deal of emphasis on support of crew members. You know, when it became apparent that reliefs could not be uh, planned on time, people were being delayed, stuck on board the ships. Uh, mental health became an issue. Uh, at Columbia, we started our own mental health hotline to have support for the crews on board. Um, a lot of the things that Jim mentioned, completely valid and being faced by pretty much every seafarer. When you look at the vaccination, there's also the point that a lot of owners, and we as Columbia, a third party manager, as well as a manager for owner, um, a lot of owners are looking at only vaccinated crew. So I believe, you know, if we look at Omicron and moving forward, crew shortage, crew availability, not only the, the capability to conduct the reliefs on time, but actually having enough seafarers in the marketplace are going to be an issue. And another thing that we've been forced to do, I think, as an industry, is consider the fact that we do not speak with one voice. We're a fragmented industry with every owner, every manager, 
working, I'll say to their own ends, but that's only a, a brief description. Unlike the vast majority of other industries, we don't have a common voice when we go to IMO, when we go to governments. Uh, and we, you know, at Columbia, we've had particular cases when we couldn't land sick or injured seafarers because of local regulations. And this goes to Jim's comment that seafarers are not regarded as key workers and we don't have an industry body forcing that issue through IMO, through governments to determine the fact that they are. So, I mean, these are things that will develop and I believe the Omicron variant will further drive the industry to go down this road. Absolutely. And, you know, as a, as a former seafarer, you know, I've, I've lived that, I've lived that life and I can completely bear testament to the, to the additional stresses of being on board. But, you know, maybe I can offer a slightly counterpoint. I mean, we are, we're going through a global crisis. There's no question about that. But, you know, humanity, and I don't want to sound ideological here, is resilient. You know, uh, people regain their appetite for flying within months of 9-11 attacks. You know, uh, bankers quickly recover their enthusiasm for profits and bonuses, you know, after the global financial crisis. So there is, there will be that, you know, we'll come out of, come out of the other end. And I guess some of the lessons learned will only make, uh, make us uh, stronger. Right, so if, if we kind of move on, uh, on, on the same thread, uh, you know, and I'd like to give a quick reminder to the audience that you can ping across your questions through the chat box. Um, you know, while the front pages have given concerning news about COVID, and we, we all sort of, you know, intimately aware of that, hidden in the business pages, we've at least had some good news, you know, uh, the shipping and, and dry bulk, you know, they've, they've had a, a good rally of sorts. Uh, the markets have had a good run. You know, oil has kind of recovered after a dip late November. And, you know, Randy sort of alluded to the high prices that there are, which demonstrates, you know, a good demand, regardless of, you know, how, whether, it, whether it stays or not. So the question really is, you know, how do the current energy prices vote for shipping in, in, in general? And, you know, by, by, by that, obviously, Constantinos, you said energy. So I'm using the word energy and not bunkering. So do you want to comment on that, uh, please, Constantinos? Uh, yes, sure. Well, I can say that the current high energy prices are, of course, uh, an issue, uh, especially as demand steadily picks up, despite the sometimes serious hiccups. Uh, for example, we know that there are certain OPEC countries, such as Angola or Nigeria, which, can, which cannot meet the declared production increases. Uh, on the other hand, the main drivers, Saudi, Russia, appear less concerned about that. Still, there is increased concern that we will witness oversupply, at least for the beginning of next year. And this will have an extensive effect and downward pressure on prices. But um, for now, we need a steady flow of supply, irrespective of the volatile demand which I personally believe will straighten itself out in a few months once we mainly see how Omicron is finally assessed and uh, how central banks decide to tackle rising inflation, something which is, uh, which is not uh, far ahead. But uh, despite high energy prices, and the last point on how these both were for shipping in terms of capacity, I would say, as you see, because uh, Randy mentioned the slow speed as one of the ways uh, to deal with uh, decarbonization. Uh, it's something we do not yet see because of the dry market uh, frenzy. We see uh, accelerated speeds and uh, that seems to be balancing the, uh, the energy. Right. Randy, can I come to you, please? Because, you know, obviously you sit in the center of, uh, you know, all of this uh, data that's coming in, you know, what is it? What does it signify? Where on the one side, you know, there's so much uncertainty, and on the other side, generally speaking, we are at historic highs in terms of, you know, at least the container and the dry bulk side of uh, things in terms of equity. So, would you like to comment on that, please? Yeah, you know, I think there's certainly a lot of uncertainty over the next few years um, in terms of energy and in commodities, um, but you know, they're very different sectors, right? When you look from tankers to dry bulk to containers, 
containers are, are certainly doing well in a Omicron stay at home lockdown environment, right? Everyone's spending all their money on goods rather than services. You've had massive congestion, not only in LA and Long Beach, but also here in Houston, Savannah, Georgia, up in Vancouver, pretty much around the world. So uh, the container trade is completely disconnected uh, from a lot of the others. Now, there's a little overlap maybe on dry bulking containers because you've seen some containers going on dry bulk vessels. You've seen some containerized goods being switched over to dry bulk vessels as well. So uh, there's a little bit of overlap. But when it comes to dry bulk, right, it's really about supply, supply of iron ore coming out of Vale, especially on the iron ore uh, to China uh, trade, as well as coal, right? And when your prices of iron ore and coal are $100 plus dollars per ton, there's a lot of room in there for shipping uh, and, and to pay that price. So um, the dry bulk market is very strong right now. Um, obviously, there's, there's a lot of kind of short-term headwinds with Evergrande default and, you know, China shutting in the steel production. Uh, I know the, uh, the gentleman from Starbuck can discuss more about that. But um, certainly that market is set up for a great 2022. You have very low supply growth. Um, global GDP is going to be 4% plus, and that's really the driver, especially of the minor bulks within dry bulk. And then switching over to tankers quickly, that really is a, a more energy-focused, kind of oil and gas-focused um, uh, market, right? And, and right now, it's kind of the inverse of what we saw in 2020, where it was all about low crude prices and everyone building inventories. Now, prices have gone up dramatically. So people will continue to draw down their inventories. Because again, if you look at the forward curve in crude oil and in refined products, it's backwardated. So most people expect prices to be lower six months from now, a year from now. As a result, you're going to use your inventories today and then buy three, six, nine months from now. So that tanker recovery has certainly been delayed um, because of the weak demand uplift due to ongoing lockdowns, um, limited travel, um, low demand, especially for jet fuel, refinery utilization is still pretty low. So all that being said, there's a lot more correlation with tankers and energy and oil and gas, at least, uh, than the others. But again, when you have very high fuel prices, you will, now, if rates are crazy levels, like in container and even in some dry bulk asset classes, you're not going to slow down at all, for sure. But as fuel prices rise, slow steaming becomes more important, right? And we've seen it in tankers. Look how slow those tankers are going right now because rates are so weak. Um, and then when dry bulk in containers, yes, there will be some moderation in speeds as rates kind of normalize from these very high levels. So all that being said, you know, we're certainly more bullish on dry bulk and containers in 2022 than we are for tankers, but that market will improve. Is it January? Is it April? Is it June? Is it October? Uh, only time will tell, and only Omicron and other COVID variants uh, will tell. But again, over the next year, I, I'd like the, uh, the dry bulk and container space a little more than tankers. Understood. And, you know, uh, uh, James, maybe I can come to you because, you know, obviously, you know, commodity prices are going through, you know, I've, I've read the word super cycle, right, which means that as economies open up and they will open up, you know, there'll be more demand for commodities. Obviously, they're carried on ships that puts pressure on the technical management of ships. So, uh, you know, uh, from your from your perspective, are there any, you know, uh, how does it how do you see uh, how do you sort of reconcile those two things? That on the one side, it's becoming harder for crew changes and really running the operations of ships. And on the other hand, I would imagine that, you know, ships are uh, in general demand, right? Everybody wants to move commodities from one part of the world to another. So how do you square that circle? Uh, it's uh, a difficult one uh, to sort of deal with, uh, to be quite frank. But uh, having listened uh, to the feedback from two colleagues on the panel there, I agree with their sort of assessment of the market. But, you know, what we're witnessing could result in, in production disruptions due to the high cost of energy to the manufacturing industry. And uh, that will bring about a subsequent impact uh, being realized within our global supply chain, especially within 2022. And, and if that does happen, then, then the impact uh, does come uh, within uh, the ability to utilize our assets uh, in the best way. And uh, you know, maintain those uh, supply chains uh, for uh, the globe in general. I mean, if you continue with uh, some of the price hikes and uh, we, we uh, discussed uh, sort of LNG as a fuel for the future, 
But uh, price hikes uh, in the gas sector, they, they do have the potential to dampen demand growth for LNG within 2022 and uh, sort of uh, perhaps uh, push uh, companies, organizations to stand back and reevaluate uh, over the short term. But, uh, you know, those are negatives, uh, sort of, uh, and we have to deal with them. Uh, Duncan touched on uh, sort of us uh, yeah, not being unified uh, sort of uh, as an industry. And uh, sort of, uh, I would agree with that comment. And I suggest that uh, for us to get through these periods uh, of challenge, uh, that uh, we need to start reacting uh, sort of as a global society, as a global industry, uh, and all our market sectors need to collaborate uh, you know, rather than trying to differentiate at this particular point in time. And by doing so, we'll work together to ensure that we don't end up in a trough and then find it difficult to get out of it. And, uh, you know, maybe to sum that up, uh, I mean, our leaders need to be clear uh, by unilaterally defining the reality that we have to deal with. But most importantly, we have to define the objective that is going to be a benefit to our industry. Yeah. Whether that be short, medium or long term. I completely understand you. There is this element of not in my backyard with with shipping because it's you know it's yep. the invisible it's the invisible force, right? Uh, uh, and, and then you know sort of uh, the let's say the people who go to the supermarket seldom realize where the goods have come from. Um, right. So you know moving on, I mean we've we've got to sort of shift our gaze to let's say the next year and the immediate future that's 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 touching us. You know, uh, we know that, you know, uh, uh, this is mid-December and all organizations are feverishly putting or have already put final touches on the budgets uh, for 2022. Uh, what are the key challenges that, that yourselves in your respective areas that you're, you're sort of, you know, you're factoring in, right? So this is, this is something that you're foreseeing will impact business in, in, in 22 uh, and, and you know, you've catered for it. So Steve, can I, can I come to you first, right? What, what do you see as the key challenges in the sort of bunkering space, if I may? I think obviously the, the, the key focus at the moment is definitely decarbonization um, and, and how obviously shipping yeah. can actually achieve the, the targets which are being set. <clears throat> What I found uh, quite a, quite encouraging and amazing is the the um, if we look at the IMO 2020, even up to a few months towards the end of 2019, a number of shipping companies were still quite unsure over the fuel choices that they would be making. However, uh, as soon as we got past 2020, a focus definitely switched to you know, the 2030, the 2050 targets, uh, and obviously the whole decarbonisation challenge. And I think, you know, what we're seeing already over the last 12 months is a real um, interest in different fuel types and how, you know, each of these fuel types may be adapted to be fit for purpose for marine, uh, for, for marine use. So <clears throat> whilst obviously we still have the traditional uh, fuels and ma maintaining obviously the quality of those fuels, whether it be VLSFOs, HSFO, MGO, um, obviously new fuels are coming to the market. So what we're going to see is a wider fuel mix, um, certainly uh, from now and over the next next 10 years. So we're already seeing uh, a lot of interest in biofuels. Uh, we've tested an, an awful lot of biofuels so far. We're developing uh, and improving new um, methodologies to, to look at the key parameters involved in biofuels. We're also now being asked to, to get more involved in, in approaches on, on methanol. So for us as a, as, as a business, the challenge is, can we effectively learn enough about these fuels and produce the relevant solutions which will support shipping in order to make sure that these fuels are fit for purpose, that they are compliant, but also at the same time, we can protect the assets, we can protect the crew, and, and these are, are the challenges that are going forward. Also, there's a much greater demand for digitalization and data and you know, we're producing a number of new platforms now where you can access vast amounts of data at relatively, um, you know, in relatively easy terms in order to give you more information with regard in operations, procurement decisions. So all of these things are, are driving the industry forward at a much faster rate. And I think it's that speed of change, which has definitely been evident to us at VPS that shipping is really gathering momentum now from a, 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 an industry which was traditionally sort of seen as a, a quite a conservative industry, it's hardly that anymore. It's really progressive now and really moving forward. And the challenge is, is just to keep pace. Indeed, no, thank you very much. And you know, uh, 
I think, you know, Randy summed up nicely, you know, the kind of challenges and, and, and the figure that I remember is the 40% decarbonization, 70%, and then eventually to net zero. And, you know, we, 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 2030 is, is in terms of shipbuilding is around the corner, right? Because yeah, the ships sure. that we've ordered today will come into effect in 24, 25, and they will yeah. do most of the lifting for it. So, uh, uh, Duncan, could I sort of come to you, you know, talking about ships and talking about multi-fuels, you know, when you order ships or when you take over ships, I mean, is that, is that now a consideration for you about the different types of fuels that the ship can use, dual fuels, and, you know, uh, Steve <coughs> mentioned uh, biofuels, methanol, LNG. How do, how do, you, how do you factor that, please? The, the fuels that we're looking at now, I mean, if we're talking about LNG, that was everybody's darling a couple of years back. And now there's mutterings that it's maybe not quite the environmental angel that everybody was thinking about. Um, we're looking at uh, methanol now. We're looking at biofuels. Um, and if you look at the, the number of slots being taken up, new building-wise, we're talking about the capacity, people are tending to go towards the LNG methanol and also looking at this useful life cycle of the vessel uh, for a transition and you know, I, I call them transitional fuels, if you like. We're still dealing with fuels that we've been aware of for many years, LNG, methanol, biofuel, even ammonia. Uh, and if you look, I've seen a couple of forecasts where by 2050, 40% uh, of the fleet are estimated to be on ammonia, 40% will be uh, on oil-based fuel and the remainder on the, what the, the legacy of transitional fuels. Uh, the point that I would make is that where's all the new technology coming from? Where's the yeah. new fuels? Where's the development going? This is something that we've known has been coming as an industry for a long, long time. And we're still talking about ammonia, which is an incredibly toxic compound as a fuel on board a vessel, which actually makes me a little bit scared when you think of the possibilities there. Uh, methanol, green methanol, it has to be green. I mean, if it's produced from natural gas, then it's not really an environmentally friendly fuel. All of these factors are being taken in. And the only thing you know that we can say is that major owners will plump with a specific technology. Um, I could be cynical and say that's to wave a green flag rather than to be committed to the environment. But you have some who will plump to uh, use methanol. You'll have some who will build uh, large container vessels, dual fuel LNG. This is all an in th these are all designed as an interim measure for the period of the next 15 years. Where we go beyond yeah. that is still crystal ball stuff, in my opinion, anyway. I think that's the, you know, sort of you've completely said that. I mean, LNG, we spent the past uh, maybe 10 years talking about LNG, and it went from being the future to being the past uh, relatively yeah. quickly. Uh, uh, however, I think, you know, when, when one looks at the sort of data, you know, sort of LNG and biofuels, I think, Steve, you mentioned still are the horses that most ship owners are sort of, you know, betting on. Uh, so I guess, you know, if I can come to, you know, Constantinos, you know, when you look at, obviously, you know, you're aware of your sort of strategy, but, you know, as a, your 22 strategy, but as you look beyond, you know, uh, is that, is that, does that change the nature of procurement, you think, if we start thinking about, you know, methanol and ammonia and, 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 you know, uh, biofuels as, as energy, not not the you know not classical fossil fuels. Well, first of all, I don't think that uh, 2022 will be that decisive, in the sense that it's not the year when things will change all at once. I mean, all yeah. years from now on, 2021 was all such a year, are transformative in the sense that each one brings us closer to the date, be it 2030 or 2050, by when vital developments must have been affected. Now, yes, the multi-fuel ship has appeared hesitantly, but it has, and in the next three, four years, we will indeed see more such ships, but we still have a few years until we see either clear contender 
or a significant number of vessels turning to this direction. Still, we must all concede, I think, that oil, which should, of course, definitely lead itself in a much greener direction, will continue to be used extensively for the next two years. So we're not done with fossil fuels yet. With that in mind, decision makers should all focus in reducing energy insecurity so to avoid extremely high prices, which at the end of the day are never a good uh, for, for, for anyone uh, involved. Uh, as far as our strategy is concerned, we do what I think all companies must do, which is uh, being continuous contact and consultation with all stakeholders, classification societies, flag administrations, engine makers, uh, partners in R&D projects, uh, green initiatives in which they may participate, and of course, the existing counterparties, such as bunker suppliers, who are and must be always abreast of regulations which affect business. Bunkering infrastructure uh, could be termed okay for certain alternative fuels, such as methanol, for example, or LNG, but uh, for others, such as uh, hydrogen or ammonia, uh, these are yet, uh, as yet, dot in the horizon. The discussions are extensive, but they're still theoretical. So for companies which have not uh, decided which vessel is the clear contender, which fuel is a clear contender, I think that a multi-layered approach uh, is called for. For example, uh, we at Sarabal, we participate in an extensive, extensive number of R&D projects. We're in the Getting to Zero Coalition, uh, Global Maritime Forum, the Call to Action Signatory. We are the first shipping company uh, based in Greece, which has uh, participated in the carbon disclosure project. Uh, and there are, of course, other efficiency measures, which uh, major ship all shipping companies, not only major ones, should uh, consider adapting in order to make their fleet more efficient, alternative ways towards compliance. We must not wait for the magic fuel to appear because it will not. It will be a mix of options, each one with pros and cons. In the meantime, there are efficiency measures such as energy saving devices, uh, performance measurements, which are submitted to the IMO uh, standardly for verifying uh, this uh, saving, uh, premium undefiling, et cetera, et cetera. All in all, this is a multi-layered strategy and bunker procurement, which is now, as I said, energy procurement is something which must take into consideration uh, all such factors. Well, thanks, uh, Constantinos. Randy, if I may ask a sort of, a, you know, a sort of a market-based question on this. So obviously, as you as you rightly put, you know, for the IMO 2020, you know, we had the two groups, right, who adopted different strategies, and you know, broadly speaking, are pursuing those strategies. You know, is there any is there a first mover advantage in the new field space? In other words, would the markets recognize, you know? ESG investing is a big thing, right? Uh, is, a, is, is a big uh, initiative across the equity market. Is there any advantage or would you say is there a premium in a shipping company sort of laying out its 2030 strategy? Because generally, you know, everyone is trying, you know, trying to see how the, how the you know, situation develops. Yeah, I think there's certainly a, a lot of push for companies to discuss IMO 2023 and especially IMO 2030 and the strategies for compliance. In terms of first mover advantage, you know, you, you'd probably get, I don't know, arguably penalized in the near term if a company that was trading at a big discount to NAV placed a big order for uh, ammonia ready ships or hydrogen or LNG ready, whatever the case may be. Partially because it, we're still a little early. If you're really looking at IMO 2020, uh, 2030, excuse me, you don't need to order that ship today, right? You can wait three, four, five years really and still get it by 2028, 2029. So it, it's hard. You know, you certainly want to have a strategy in place and how we're going to, you know, sell off our older vessels, slow steam some of our current vessels, certainly renew the fleet with newer engine types. But again, because it's still a risk. Right. Do we go LNG? Do we wait for something better? Right. Uh, better uh, either hydrogen or ammonia or methanol, um, you know, because of that uncertainty, it's still a big risk here. Uh, whereas on the scrubber side, you know, you were pretty comfortable with the scrubber investments. It was not a huge lead time. You didn't have to order it three years in advance. Uh, the CapEx was, as I said, two to four million, not 
a hundred million dollars or whatever it may be for a large, you know, uh, hydrogen fueled ship. So I think the the jury's still out, um, and because of that. I don't see really a big benefit in going all in on certain things. Now, there have been some companies who have ordered two, three, four uh, LNG dual fuel ships or ammonia ready ships just to prepare for. Uh, but I don't think anyone's willing or really able uh, to go super, you know, bullish or on one side of the industry or one side of the fuel uh, versus another until we have more clarity, which is likely by 2023, 2024. So we should see more of that in the next few years. Understood. And, you know, this is such a fascinating panel that, you know, we can, we're sort of almost running out of time, right? I'd love to keep, keep on going, but we've got to take some questions that are coming in for, for the floor. I guess the first question is, you know, how do we plan for an increasingly regulated industry? I think that everyone is coming around to the fact that, you know, we, we shipping traditionally has been always, you know, driven by a commercial imperative and, you know, experience. Regulation has not really, you know, been a factor. But I mean, anybody who wants to take that question, how do we plan for an increasingly regulated industry? Uh, I, I can maybe start that off, uh, Alok. Um, yeah, certainly uh, within Wee Group, uh, I mean, uh, our view is stay attuned uh, to the regulatory bodies and the many subject matter expert platforms that exist. Uh, you know, IMO, flag state, class, chamber of shipping, the likes. And uh, sort of, um, you know, keep involved uh, with those and uh, sort of proactively engage and, uh, you know, from those outputs, uh, you know, apply those uh, to any strategy that's being considered uh, in the future. But in picking up on, on that change, uh, it's uh, also identifying uh, sort of uh, the impact that it will have on any organizational resource and uh, sort of uh, ensuring uh, that uh, the resource is capable of taking on board the, the change and implementing it, executing it uh, successfully. So certainly that is, is how we uh, keep tabs on uh, so that the industry and regulation has been applied. Okay, thank you, thank you very much. Um, you know, again, a question, I'm tr trying to paraphrase the question from the floor. I think it is, it is probably best I direct this to you, Constantino. So really, you know, if we look at procurement, it's kind of win-lose, right? I mean, that's how the equation is because there's a lot of focus on price, you know, there's a lot of focus and, and the perception is that one side wins and the other side loses. So I guess the question from the floor is, how can the suppliers and the buyers work together towards decarbonization? Well, they must both do their homework on a daily basis and uh, participate in a wide field of both associations, discussions and fora that uh, are at play. For example, I can mention the International Bangor Industry Association where I'm a board member and we have some 500 odd members from all spectrums of the industry, suppliers, traders, owners, brokers, uh, experts, specialists, financiers, insurers. So everybody has to be able to, to converse. Uh, I don't necessarily agree that one side wins and the other loses. It is challenging for suppliers. The competition is fierce and it will be even fiercer going on because banker suppliers of today are not necessarily the banker suppliers of tomorrow with all these new fuels coming in. We don't know what type of companies will be selling this type of alternative fuels, not your traditional uh, supplier. So we see um, the, the framework changing gradually, but I think that now more than ever, total transparency, due diligence, as I said earlier, which needs to be affected from the first day between supplier and owner, will hopefully reduce, first of all, disputes, which are unfortunately still the case, especially in some areas of the world, where especially MFMs are not applicable yet, so you need to reduce disputes and you need to discuss what type of infrastructure is needed going forward. Now, this will take time, this will take years, but discussions, I can assure you, because I participate very heavily in the future fuel discussion within the EBA Association and uh, within Starbuck, of course, uh, has already started. And uh, I heard both Duncan and Jim saying earlier, they're absolutely right, that we don't have a unified voice. This is 
humanely impossible, but at least we can let, not necessarily, as they say, all roses bloom, but all people who have a specific set of arguments without hidden agendas, especially political agendas, be able to speak out and, uh, you know, discuss even when they disagree with each other. Yeah. For my part and Starbucks part, uh, we do that with suppliers constantly. There is no other way you can progress your business, any type of fuel you're using. Absolutely. No, I mean, I, I think certainly we've made a start by bringing the panel together, right? I think if that is something to go by, there is at least a unified voice here. Uh, uh, look, uh, you know, we would love to carry on, but, uh, you know, unfortunately, we are out of time. Uh, there are more questions, so I just want to uh, tell the audience that we will be answering those questions. Uh, I, will, I hope that uh, the audience and the panel have been suitably informed and entertained by this lively debate. Um, I'd like to thank everyone, the audience and the panelists for taking the time and of course to Capital Link for helping organize the event. So that's it folks, uh, happy holidays and see you next time. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very thank much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Been a bye pleasure. Bye-bye.